present. My name is Karen Hausknecht. I'm the Associate Provost for Research and Scholarship here at UNE. I want to welcome all of you here in Leonard Hall and those who are joining us via live stream. Um, I'm really, really pleased and excited to um, welcome back to UNE Dr. Cliff Rosen. Um, Cliff is a senior scientist and director of the Center for Clinical and Translational Research at Maine Health Institute of Research. He has a lot of other titles. He's also a professor of medicine at Tufts Medical School. He's the co-PI on the NIH-funded Northern New England Clinical and Translational Research in Network. Um, and he is a member of the NIH National Advisory Council on Aging. So Cliff is an internationally renowned expert in endocrinology and bone biology and aging. And he's also an amazing mentor of student um, trainees in the lab, including students from UNE. So we're really delighted to have him join us today to talk about his work on long COVID and also research opportunities at Maine Health. Please um, join me in welcoming Cliff. Thanks, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here. I love UNE med students. Um, I constantly tell people down the street at Maine Med that we never see tough students. We always see UNE medical students. And they work very hard. We love them. And if anybody's interested afterwards, or send me a text or an email uh, at rosenc at mmc.org. But uh, we've had a number of successful students as well as um, uh, faculty who have trained at our institution. So I'm going to talk about um, long COVID. Um, and I don't have any conflicts. I am an editor at New England Journal, so I get to see most of the long COVID um, uh, papers that come to us. And most of them are pretty junky. But, um, but we're beginning to get an understanding of what this is. And I must say, I have to talk to uh, skeletal biologists in two weeks in Texas about long COVID. And I was thinking about how, what's the relevance of long COVID to bone biology. And what I realized is the long COVID is going to be with us for a long time. And each of you is going to see patients, I think, that are going to have symptoms of long COVID. And even if they don't have long COVID, it'll be in the differential diagnosis. I can almost guarantee you of that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the prevalence, uh, the symptomatology, and clinical diagnosis, then talk a, a little bit about pathophysiology, uh, because all bets are off. We really don't understand this multi-system disease, and so it presents great research opportunities for all of you to think about. Remember, I'm a bone biologist. What am I doing talking about uh, an infectious disease? And people have asked me that. And I think part of the reason is, one, because it's so relevant uh, in our society, but also because the biology and the science needs to be discovered. And we need to understand what's going on in order to uh, really take care of patients, which is the bottom line for all of us. I was laughing with my wife the other day that I had a dream that I was back in my residency. And I loved being chief resident. I loved being on the, on the floor. I should go back to that. And she said, what are you doing? You have 85 things on your plate. What do you want to be a chief president again 50 years later? I don't, but I do. I am interested in the clinical science around this disease. And so it's really attracted me. OK, so this is the coronavirus. I'm sure many of you know about it. You've taken microbiology or virology or whatever they teach you now in uh, med school. Um, but the key thing to remember is that this is a medium-sized virus with uh, a large uh, a message RNA and um, uh, genome. And uh, the spike protein is what's been characteristic that what we understand about this is its attachment to uh, specific receptors. But remember also there is a nucleocapsid uh, protein which uh, encases the uh, nucleus and is important in, uh, uh, clinically for understanding a response to a viral infection of, uh, of symptoms that you could attribute to long COVID. But I will say that's all up for debate. And just to remind you that the virus is like an endocrine hormone. That's why I'm sort of attracted to it, because it has a receptor. And it uh, sticks to its receptor, and the uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme uh, 
Receptor 2 is one of the most important ones for binding the virus and getting it inside where it then will take over control of, uh, of uh, protein synthesis. Uh, but there are other co-receptors that are important uh, and that have been studied as well, including DPP-4, which you may know if you've studied pharmacology, DPP-4 or dipetyl uh, peptidase is important for breaking down GLP-1, which is important in insulin sensitivity. So the time course is arbitrary, but we tend to think of this as being a four-week time period of acute infection. And I'm not going to talk too much about acute infection, except to tell you that the acute infection almost certainly is responsible for long COVID down the road. And as we've tried to evolve and understand that process, We've looked to other virus infections to see if there are similarities or differences, and whether reactivation of, an, of, of previous viruses or antibodies to previous viruses can cross-react um, and lead to an antibody-antigen type of response that is part and parcel of long COVID. Don't worry about the small print in the time course for long COVID. We'll, we'll catch up with the symptoms. One of the things that's I'm sure you're all aware, is this overwhelming degree of inf inflammation that occurs with the acute onset of uh, a, a viral infection with uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the upper respiratory tract. Uh, and this can lead to uncontrolled inflammation, um, increases in cytokine release, which are rather dramatic, and of course, for which antibodies have been produced and monoclonal antibodies have been used to treat individuals uh, with long COVID, I mean, with acute COVID, uh, there are vascular defects, oxidative stress, and this really profound lymphocyte apoptosis and lymphocyte suppression, which leads to an increase in T regulatory uh, cell uh, uh, expression. Um, and there's epigenetic modifications um, uh, along with a number of other um, uh, sequelae in the acute uh, infection. And of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia is rather toxic and can lead to chronic fibrosis, scarring, and pulmonary disease. So a number of systemic factors play into this. Hypercoagulability is really important. So clotting is one of the bigger uh, problems in uh, patients that have acute SARS-CoV-2. There's impaired inter interferon signaling. Um, and dysregulated immunity. And although glucocorticoids are extremely useful and one of the few drugs that's been found to be very effective in reducing death rates in acute uh, SARS-CoV-2, that may predispose individuals to later onset of complications, including diabetes. So what do, what do we call this condition? Um, well, I think long COVID is stuck. It's not the greatest term. Uh, but it's the most commonly used, and I'll show you some artificial intelligence about how, the, how that makes it difficult for us to sort of sort out what we're talking about. Post-COVID uh, conditions is what the CDC and WHO call it, and we call it PASC, or post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2, and that's what we use at the NIH um, almost exclusively. Uh, in October of, of 2021, uh, uh, the first ICD code for um, SARS-CoV-2 long infections, or PASC, was introduced. And this is important when we think about um, how do we find the prevalence of this disease. So we can do large longitudinal studies, but that takes time. So how do we understand how many people have long COVID in the United States? And as you all you have to do is go to Google and ask that question, and you'll get 100 different answers from 1% to as high as 25, or some people say 50% of individuals will have long COVID. So the introduction of the ICD code is very useful because it provides a little bit of standardization in electronic health records. And why is that important? Because now we can use artificial intelligence to scan large scale electronic health records and begin to get some idea of the prevalence. And the ICD code really reflects three or four of the major symptoms, brain fog, fatigue, cough, uh, and shortness of breath. And, um, uh, but it's a lot more than that. And so 
uh, we've, I've been working with a group at, at Harvard uh, looking at uh, artificial intelligence of a million uh, uh, case records for, uh, from electronic health records. And we quickly realized that the ICD code has totally underestimated the individuals that have long COVID. One, because it just began in October of last year, and two, because there are so many symptoms, as I'll show you, that are not uh, uh, inserted into the ICD code. So providers are not well educated in what they should be putting down for ICD codes. So a, a relatively easy way to think about this is, one, the acute sick patients who come out of the ICU, some have been on ECMO or a ventilator, those individuals are going to have chronic post-ICU syndrome. And it's likely that some of that is what contributes to long COVID in those acute hospitalized patients, that there's a generalized response to um, a severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. There may be a unique aspect to the SARS-CoV-2 infection embedded within that. But I'm going to talk primarily about that second bar, which is the post-acute infections that occur in individuals who are either mildly ill or even asymptomatic. And there, you have very specific tissue-targeted uh, changes which compose part of the long COVID syndrome. So you can, you can sort of separate out that. It's not that we don't want to study those individuals that are very, very ill, but we understand and know that those people are, are going to be sick for a lot of different reasons. And many of them relate to the drugs that were used, the ICU, the duration. I mean, if somebody's on ECMO, that's a huge traumatic stress to the system on top of their acute, horrible illness. So let's think about those individuals like you and I and others who get acute COVID. What are the post-COVID symptoms? And as I said, dyspnea, fatigue, post-exertional malaise, and brain fog represent the top four. And those are the ones that we most likely see uh, and are part of the ICD uh, code that I mentioned. But as you can see, there's a number of other different components to this syndrome. Uh, and it really affects all uh, all of the tissue systems. So diarrhea is common, uh, 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 orthostatic hypotension with associated tachycardia, what we call POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, is very frequent among those individuals who get long COVID. Um, and that autonomic dysfunction can lead to a number of different contributing morbidities. So this is just, I just show this as a bit of a cartoon last week at our weekly AI meeting with uh, the group Enference, is a company that George Church started in Boston at Harvard. They've, they've got one million uh, electronic health records from the Mayo Clinic Health System. And so they've been able to um, try to piece together what we think of long COVID. And they do that, one, by scanning daily every single printed piece of information or every information piece that's on the web, whether it's on the internet, whether it's in an article, whether it's in a magazine, wherever it is. And they've come up with 47 signal phenotypes that refer to long COVID. The CDC phenotypes, which are more standardized and are related more to, uh, to the uh, uh, ICD code, uh, we found 23 of those. So this interplay between the number of uh, sets of information that are out there, data points for long COVID, whatever is referred to in a way of long COVID in an article is, is, is considered a positive signal. That overlap tells us there's about 16 different components to this syndrome that people refer to on a regular basis. So I just point out that we see it in children, especially adolescents, uh, a very similar phenotype, uh, and their clinical course is similar, although a little more muted and less severe. Um, and this is true for non-hospitalized as well as hospitalized children. So what's the prevalence? And this is where we run into real issues because we need to capture those individuals. 
Um, it's increasingly harder because people are getting tested at home. So we don't have a good sense of how many people are infected, let alone go to the doctors afterwards with these uh, symptoms. But you can see that fatigue, which is a very common complaint in clinical practice, is still about 50% of, uh, uh, of the individuals will complain of uh, fatigue, dyspnea, myalgia, muscle aches are really common as well. And this is just a meta-analysis that the, in, the prevalence of long COVID among published trials is about 30%. But I think that's a little misleading. Again, we have a huge knowledge gap. And really, you know, I was never a big fan of electronic health records and, ma and managing large data sets. But AI and uh, machine learning really have pushed the envelope so we can get a better sense, at least for those individuals who are going to a provider. And again, the ICD code becomes important to some degree in order to chart that actual prevalence. So I would say, in summary, we don't know the true prevalence of long COVID, how many people actually develop it once they've gotten over their long COVID, I mean, their acute COVID, but I would say we're in the range of 10 to 50%. Some of the early data from the UK would suggest that by about four or five months of age, much four or five months after the acute infection, and again, timing of the acute infection becomes important, and reinfection becomes even more important because we don't understand whether reinfection exaggerates the potential for long COVID, or if it wasn't there, it only shows up after a second or third infection. But generally, many of those people do better um, over time. And so the true prevalence beyond one year is a little less clear. So one of the most important things in medicine is the literature. And being able to scan the literature is really critical. And in this field, the breakthroughs or the publications are so important because they give us some idea. So this just came up last Friday from Lancet Psychiatry. It's the largest series of follow-ups in long COVID, 1.28 million people that have been followed with uh, acute SARS-CoV-2. They weren't looking at prevalence so much, but what they were looking at is how do those uh, conditions, the ones that I mentioned, the symptoms and signs, how do they progress over time? And if you look on the left in the, uh, in the first column on the left, and I apologize, it's, it's small, but what they did is they compared acute SARS-CoV-2 post-infection with acute viral infections that were not SARS-CoV-2. And what they found was that things like anxiety disorder, the, there was a 13% increased risk of anxiety disorders, but by 417 days, if you read the very top, it came down to the same level as the acute non-SARS-CoV-2 infection. So yes, you have a, a greater risk of anxiety disorders, but it may be similar, it just more exaggerated than acute infections. But when you see those NRs, and I know you gotta have really good eyes to see the NRs, what that represents is those symptoms that do not occur or do not match up at any time out to two years at any time with post-acute non-SARS-CoV-2 infections. So we know that acute viral infections can lead to post-acute symptoms, but the fact of the matter is, and I think this is the proof in the pudding, that the SARS-CoV-2 infection produces a much more dramatic and extended period of symptomatology and some of those symptoms, some of those symptoms don't ever cross the symptoms associated with acute viral infections that are not SARS-CoV-2. In particular, myoneural disjunction or muscle disease, which we don't see post-acute infection, psychotic disorders, epilepsy, and uh, insomnia, None of these, and dementia and cognitive deficits, none of those matched up with the acute infection. And on the right, you can see the uh, hazard ratios. So individuals post-COVID 
are at acute risk of neuro, neurosensory, neuromuscular problems. And I can tell you from the, study, from the subjects we've recruited in, in up the street on Route 1 in Scarborough, we've got 90 long COVID subjects, um, those neurosymptoms are very, one, they're complicated, two, they're very common. So um, I had the naive idea that working with inference, we could actually identify potential risks because what uh, inference has in a million data sets is not just uh, acute infection and then post-infection, but they have pre-infection data on almost a million subjects. So ideally, you could tell, okay, these people weren't sick, then they were sick, then they got sicker with long COVID. So it's a very simple approach, but of course, nothing in medicine is simple. And although uh, I'm an idealist, I wasn't able to really uh, find any pre-laboratory uh, marker that would predict those individuals who, once they got COVID, would go on to develop long COVID. That was one of our goals. Is, was there something in their inherent chemistry that predisposed them to acute SARS-CoV-2 and then long COVID. And of course, that's just too simple for anybody to, uh, and somebody would have figured it out before I did for sure. But what I can tell you is in the million subjects that we looked at and those that had SARS-CoV-2 is about 100,000, um, you can see the time course for these symptomatologies. And so over time, as I mentioned, between a month and 365 days after the acute infection, there is a, a declining number of subjects who continue to have those symptoms. So I would argue that the number of long COVID individuals um, currently that are beyond one year of symptoms is probably in the range of two to 5%. Now, if you know, 100 million people are infected, that's a lot of people and a lot of a burden on the healthcare system. So just to remind you, there's multiple long-term sequelae that you could see and that will be in your differential when you start to see these individuals. Everything from psychiatric to cardiovascular. And I mentioned POTS because I think that's one of the most common uh, long-term side effects is this postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. And the, the participants come in and they'll tell me, uh, particularly our number one, for our first participant we recruited, I, and she's a researcher, and she said, I just can't stand up. Every time I stand up, I get dizzy and lightheaded, and, and I've been to the doctor, and I had superventricular tachycardia induced by just standing up. These are very problematic for quality of life uh, and makes things very, very difficult for individuals. So there's no laboratory test. If you see these individuals, forget it. The, the lab test can be anything. Um, and nothing very diagnostic. So that's what we know or don't know. We don't know the true prevalence. We know the symptomatology. We know, we think we know the duration, although I'm not sure that we're absolutely certain about that. What we don't know um, is, the, uh, is the pathophysiology. We have some ideas, and I'm going to show you those ideas because those are fertile for young minds in medical school to think about research opportunities in our lab or elsewhere. So we know that um, once the virus gets in the system, it can cause a whole bunch of things. So dystosis or microbiome changes are very common. Uh, we don't understand what they mean, but even though individuals are infected with pulmonary uh, 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 pneumonia or other pulmonary complications, their GI tract is altered. Does that, is that cause and effect? We have no idea. Um, there is this thrombosis that occurs. There is the neurosymptomatology that occurs. There is the likelihood of antibodies and autoantibodies. And individuals who already have autoimmune disease are a little more likely to go on to develop symptomatology, and probably the most um, recent and the most uh, talked about, uh, particularly in the past three to four weeks, has been the concept of viral persistence. And I'll talk to you about that in some detail, because we were lucky enough to guess 
I wrote a proposal in January on viral persistence without any really knowledge of what uh, infectious disease. And uh, we got this big award from NIH last month that said, you guys are one of the 18 groups in the country to study this. And uh, whoa, my gosh. But, but that has emerged as one of the uh, prevailing theories. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But first, I want to talk to you about PASC and uh, MECS. CFS, which I'm sure you've studied chronic fatigue syndrome, another somewhat mysterious disorder that's associated with um, or thought to be associated with chronic infection or uh, immune response. The symptomatology of PASC is almost identical in some aspects of the 14 question. CSFME questionnaire that people use to identify people with chronic fatigue syndrome. And it resembles it in many ways. The fatigue, of course, the muscle aching, the shortness of breath, the difficulty concentrating, or what we call brain fog. These are all components that are also present in CSFME. And that raises some really interesting questions about what is chronic fatigue syndrome. And many of the patient advocate groups have um, argued that when we're studying PASC, we should also be studying chronic fatigue at the same time. And there's the intersection of politics and medicine, because uh, we just don't have enough money to do that. Um, uh, uh, there's a lot more money in Congress, but it hasn't been moved by the Biden administration to support more long-term studies of long COVID. But that hasn't happened yet. And uh, we, NIH has basically spent a billion plus dollar, billion point five dollars that were um, allocated to long COVID for some of these projects that I'm going to tell you about. So anyways, uh, uh, today I was thinking about it because uh, Katie Becker, who you know is a professor here, actually was a postdoc in my lab. And she was one of the first people to suggest to me that chronic infection, in this case it was Lyme disease, may lead to musculoskeletal disorders due to uh, chronic inflammation and possible viral persistence. And I thought about that today when I was thinking that she embedded in my mind something that probably helped me write that grant about viral persistence and the, and the similarities between uh, 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 post-Lyme disease and post-COVID-2. Uh, uh, so one mechanism, uh, and you'll see this paper, it's going to come out in New England Journal very shortly. It was published in Cell, and then there's a review of the Cell paper in which they did not identify virus in brain, but what they did identify was a marked increase in uh, uh, spinal fluid uh, cytokines, particularly uh, CCL11, and a really rapid increase in the number of microglia uh, suggesting an inflammatory response. How that was triggered, we don't know. But that led to hippocampal neurogenesis being suppressed and suggestive that maybe some of the memory and brain fog issue is related to targeting of the hippocampus. So, so stay tuned because I think there's a lot more of these kind of studies. And of course, for me, a mouse physiologist at heart, to see this stuff in the mouse and then try to translate it to humans is what we do all the time, sometimes successfully and sometimes not. So the other thing that I mentioned again is uh, big data. And so we are part of an NIH grant to deposit uh, information on every main health patient who has acute COVID. Uh, and we deposit their EHR into a de-identified data set, which is considered the National COVID Cohort Collaborative, or N3C. And in that collaborative data set, which is now more than 12 million subjects, you can, in, an individual investigator, a student, anybody, could go in with the right, after passing their credentials, go in and look at what long COVID or acute COVID or what vitamin D does to acute COVID. You can do anything in that data set. And uh, I just wanted to show you that when uh, we look at long COVID coding using the ICD code, we're able to pick up four clusters in N3C 
that are uh, predominant. Neuromuscular, which I talked about, metabolic, and cardiopulmonary um, are the big ones. So, um, so three sort of global clusters, four if you think metabolic and obesity as being separate. So I wanted, I mentioned to you that we wanted to go back to the acute COVID because in acute COVID, unlike sepsis, unlike sepsis from other non-SARS-CoV-2 infections, there's a much greater predominance of type 2 diabetes or glucose intolerance. And we don't really fully understand that, uh, but poor glycemic control worsens type 2, um, uh, worsens uh, acute SARS-CoV-2. So if you're type 2 diabetic, you're at greater risk of getting severe disease. If you don't have diabetes, you're at a greater risk of developing it in response to the acute infection, particularly if you are um, uh, sick in the ICU. But we don't understand it. We think that part of the issue is that chronic inflammation is, is underlying this whole process. And in type 2 diabetes, for many of you who may or may not know, part of type 2 diabetes is its chronic inflammation. The expansion of the, marrow, of the uh, fat cells leads to a, a, an acute inflammatory and then a chronic inflammatory response in fat tissue. And that, we think, may predispose individuals uh, to enhanced chronic inflammation. And this is work from my collaborator, uh, Phil Scherer at the University of Texas Southwestern, who uh, has proposed this chronic inflammation as being a potentially major initiating source of long COVID, particularly in fat tissue, because we see this preponderance of type 2 diabetes and obesity in both our long COVID patients and in our sick acute COVID patients. And this is validated by electronic health record evaluation. The VA system, Al Ali, has done most of this work showing about a 30% greater risk of type 2 diabetes after a acute SARS-CoV-2, with or without quote unquote long COVID. So this, this is a real problem. And it traces back to the question about etiology. It's also true in children. We're seeing more children with type 2 diabetes post-acute SARS-CoV-2, both those that are obese and those that are not obese. So our hypothesis, our working hypothesis back in January, and of course this changes a lot over time, is that this post-acute SARS-CoV-2 or PASC is really a function of uh, impaired metabolic uh, homeostasis on top of um, viral persistence and an increase in cytokine release. And that leads, that increased cytokine release from chronic inflammation actually leads to T cell fatigue. So our T cells that are so important to, to downregulate the immune response and to calm things down may be actually undergoing fatigue or unable to uh, metabolize uh, glucose. Uh, and so we're going to test that in a study. Now, I didn't pull this out of nowhere. There is some evidence that macrophages uh, can uh, have viral presence in them, and particularly macrophages that surround adipose tissue, uh, what we call F480. Uh, macrophages, they, they are particular markers for chronic inflammation, and they're present in adipose tissue, particularly in individuals that are obese, and particularly in visceral adipose tissue. So we work with Jonathan Lee at Harvard at the Regan Institute, and he's shown that, of course, uh, the, when you do PCR uh, in uh, individuals, uh, or, Beyond four weeks of age, you can still four weeks after infection, you can still see the presence by uh, uh, endoscopy of viral uh, particles um, amplified by PCR in lung tissue, both in peripheral and main stem bronchus. But we were struck by the fact that in some of the other peripheral tissue, there is still viral remnants present. And he's shown in a very recent paper that those individuals that are immune compromised, the length of time to shed those viral particles is much longer. 
And we've known for a while that immunocompromise has a major uh, issue for individuals fighting acute SARS-CoV-2 and potentially for those with long COVID. So one of the biggest breakthroughs in the field, I think, and I'm prejudiced a little bit because I know the person who did it, but I had nothing to do with it, was this uh, detection of uh, using a single molecular a array. So if you see in the right-hand corner, there's an array using um, uh, a streptovitin uh, uh, beta-galaxosidase marker to measure protein in uh, individuals in their plasma after acute infection. And this paper from David Walt at the Regan showed that in the months post-diagnosis, those that had PASC had high levels or at least detectable levels of the spike protein. So he can, he can actually distinguish the spike protein from the S component of the spike protein from the nucleocapsid protein. And you can see the difference that in the long COVID individuals, you still see circulating spike protein. And to me, that suggests that viral persistence is a real issue. And where that's coming from, where it sources, we don't know. Our, our hypothesis, it comes from fat tissue, that the virus hangs out in fat tissue. And we're going to try to prove that. So the two things that I think in the last month that have really exploded in the field, one is viral persistence as a major um, uh, cause of this multi-system disease. And NIH has already embarked on a single therapeutic intervention to try to, to I think it's, I haven't seen it, but I think it's an antiviral intervention to try to reduce circulating protein, uh, circulating uh, protein and reduce chronic inflammation. So, um, and then the second thing is the preponderance of neuropsychiatric symptomatology, which is really hugely uh, relevant for quality of life as well as for other long-term issues in individuals who suffer from this. So we're part, research opportunities, we follow 90 subjects that we recruited who have had acute COVID-2. Some of those go on to develop long COVID, some don't, and we follow all those individuals as well as 10 individuals who have been consistently SARS-CoV-2 negative. And that's because the NIH and nucleocapsid antibody negative. And that's because the NIH wants to track in a longitudinal fashion, so this is over a four-year period of time, what the prevalence of this disease is, and also, is this different from other things that can occur, and even from normal control individuals who may suffer? So the three scientific questions that they got funded and spent, yeah, and were allocated a billion dollars from uh, Congress is, the clinical spectrum and biology underlying recovery from SARS-CoV-2, who doesn't recover, what that prevalence is, what's the natural history, and there are distinct phenotypes, and does infection initiator promote that pathogenesis? So this is the recover cohort sites that we, we're currently up to about 8,000 enrolled adults across the country. Um, uh, we're targeted for 18,000 adults. You probably read online that there's a lot of controversy. We're going too slow. We're not doing enough. These things take time. We just enrolled our first patient January 2nd. We have 90 subjects. It's not easy. Plus, when you bring somebody in, a participant in, to enroll in a study, it takes them about two and a half hours to fill out the forms, the informed consent, and then to do the survey which is unbelievably complex because it asks a lot of socioeconomic questions and then a lot of neuropsych questions. So this is, uh, it takes time and to, you have to do it right. You can't do a haphazard uh, study. And then in the, in the corner is our I-score network, which I'm the principal investigator along with Sally Hodder at West Virginia. We banded together 11 states that are IDEA states. You may know IDEA states. Those are states that have less than uh, uh, NIH funding than, uh, than the other two-thirds of the states, and you see them, they're primarily rural and underserved, 
and uh, we made a pitch in our grant application last fall to say we we're going to recruit underserved populations from rural areas that are often ignored in clinical studies. And in fact, um, that's exactly what we're doing. And we've basically hit our target. So it includes, um, it includes uh, Puerto Rico as well as Hawaii. And then we do a whole series of clinical exams as well as screening, case ascertainment, and in-depth imaging as well as omics, particularly on individuals that uh, are symptomatic. So I want to tell you about a couple of homegrown studies. Uh, the first is uh, something that you might uh, be attracted to. It's, it's a natural product uh, produced from spirulina, a cyanobacterium, and it's called Imulina. It's on the market currently. You can go and get it. Just walk down to Lois's in Scarborough and get it, or somewhere around here, I'm sure, is a natural food store. Uh, and it's in a lot of different foods and components, and it's available as a dietary supplement. Imulina has been shown to uh, stimulate NK killer cell activity. And so um, our iScore network um, decided to uh, propose a randomized control trial of Imulina uh, for individuals who have uh, post-acute uh, sequelae of COVID-2. And so we're going to be studying in 11 of those states that I showed you, uh, 10 subjects at each site, so um, approximately 150 individuals will be randomized to either two doses of Imulina, 300 or 600, or placebo and, um, or, sorry, 400 or 800. Um, and uh, our goal is a primary outcome is NK killer cell activity um, and as well as cytokine profiles. And we'll also be looking at psychosocial um, uh, parameters that we've gotten from recover. So all these individuals will have been in recover, which makes a nice framework. So I hope you're beginning to see the story. First, we apply and get a longitudinal study. Then we start to spin off studies from these studies that are also NIH funded in order to get a real sort of lock on what we want to look at for potential uh, uh, studies. So this is the data on our other study, which we call PROMISE, which is the pathobiology of recover metabolic and immune status. And this is going to be 60 subjects from three sites, Maine, Kentucky, and Louisiana. And we're going to measure T cell bioenergetics. There's some preliminary data suggesting that uh, T cells don't have as much oxidative phosphorylation once they've been exposed long term to SARS CoV 2. Uh, we're going to do fat biopsies. Uh, on all these individuals, and luckily we're teamed up with the group at Harvard, so we'll be measuring both viral persistence by uh, uh, QRT-PCR in, dif in different tissues, including sputum, plasma, and adipose tissue, as well as um, uh, protein using David Walt's new Samoa assay. So that's what it's called. It's a cross-sectional study. You know, the most important thing about an NIH trial is getting the right name. Uh, and so uh, we think we got it. It took me about uh, four runs. I run every day, and it took me about four of those to figure out which one would be a good uh, term. But promise sounds really good. OK, so what else? What else is out there? So I mentioned um, uh, my colleague, Phil Scherer, at UT Southwestern. And his hypothesis is that fat tissue has this inflammatory response. And in chronic obesity, the fat tissue actually becomes more fibrotic. And this fibrosis is actually interesting because it's very reminiscent of pulmonary fibrosis that we see post SARS-CoV-2. So some of our patients in that other category that have been in ECMO and have had uh, you know, pulmonary resuscitation those individuals often get uh, a form of fibrosis in which you have uh, fatty uh, deposits within the uh, fibroblasts or lipofibroblasts. And so Phil has suggested that uh, another avenue for treatment would be the use of an uh, antifibrotic agent. And particularly one that has come to mind uh, is rosiglitazone that has been used to treat type 2 diabetes. 
Um, and uh, it's still out there and isn't used as commonly as some of the other diabetic medications, but it has a profound antifibrotic effect. So you might see that happening. And this is his hypothesis that these PPR gamma agonists may reduce in the inflammatory response. And then working with Phil, um, Phil has identified a cleavage protein of collagen 6A3 uh, which is called endotrophin, which circulates and is measurable, and he has an assay for it. And it turns out that in chronic fibrotic states or chronic inflammation, endotrophin is increased. And uh, we are very excited about this because, one, we have measured it by ELISA, and two, um, we've seen it in other uh, large fa uh, phase three trials for other medications, for example, for congestive heart failure where endotrophin levels um, go down with the treatment of congestive heart failure and chronic fibrosis is, is suppressed somewhat um, in those individuals. It's associated with a drop in endotrophin. Um, and it's produced primarily by adipocytes, um, but also by fibroblasts. And this is just one NO1. Of course, we don't take much stock of NO1, but we have gotten Oh, I know, now think about 300 uh, measurements on 160 individuals in Tulane University that had, came in with acute SARS-CoV-2 and then follow up. And we don't have the clinical data because the CDC funded it, not NIH, and they're holding on to it. So there's conflict between CDC and NIH, but we're getting close to getting that clinical data. But there's one patient that was very interesting who got hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, and uh, rinavir. It was very, very sick and required uh, ICU uh, hospitalization and respirator. And his endotrophin levels initially were quite high. You can see he was getting 15 liters per minute of oxygen. He went home at day 90, and his endotrophin levels, we just measured recently, had, went down to 24. He had a recurrence of this fibrotic pulmonary symptomatology that required oxygen, his endotrophin went back up. And now, uh, after vaccines and day 411, he's better, and his endotrophin levels are coming down. So we're hopeful that we can use endotrophin as a potential marker. But of course, it's an N of 1. So uh, summarize, long COVID still needs a full definition. Multi-system involvement, viral persistence is, is likely one of the major causes. We need more research. There are a lot of opportunities. Um, you can come into the clinic. You can see subjects that have long COVID. You can follow them. Uh, we've already had some students come in and talk to these individuals. They want to talk about what's wrong. Um, uh, we're starting the PROMISE uh, study uh, probably early fall. Um, and um, uh, Erin McFarland, the second year student, has already been talking to us. She's had lab experience. She'll be helping us on that, as well as another study we're doing. And then, of course, we've got the Immulina uh, trial, which will be starting up in the fall as well. So lots of potential. You don't need to uh, have done PCR and done a lot of biochemical assays to contribute. Uh, uh, you just tell me what you're interested in. You have an idea. Be great to hear about it. All new ideas uh, would be fantastically welcome. And with that, I think I'll stop. And I think we have time for a little bit of questions, although I've got to get back for an NIH call. Thank you very much. Does anybody have a question? Oh, yes. Yeah. We love questions. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering, would the antifibrotics only be used for long COVID individuals who have pre-existing diabetes or obesity? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we were thinking that we'd use it because it's subclinical in a, in a larger randomized trial of anybody who had long COVID with the idea that we can't detect glucose intolerance in many of those individuals. So we're doing a lot of glucose tolerance tests to try to identify those, you know, individuals who are pre-diabetic that may already have that chronic inflammation. So we would consider using it in both or all of those individuals. Good question. I think we're out of... There's another oh, one. Yes. We have a quick one? Okay, right here. Yeah, quick question. Um, 
when you talked about that new era test that yes. describing Samoa. yeah yeah how you have extended um, different proteins still circulating yes. do those patients also test positive for covid still or no yeah so the only thing they tested positive for was the protein the spike protein and interestingly enough the cytokine levels did not predict who those people were. The only thing that predicted their symptoms was the detection of uh, the spike protein. So it's really interesting. Please join me in thanking Cliff again.